Welcome to the Extra Pass podcast presented by Melbourne United. I'm your host, Ben Hopkins, joined as always by my co-host, Adam Ballinger, sporting a very fresh haircut. I love it, Balls. How are you? Yeah, I'm good. Uh, thanks for noticing. I was hoping you'd notice. Um, well, it's, it's only hours old. Yeah, I got it on company time. Don't tell, don't tell the boss. <laughs> oh, don't tell anyone. I snuck out for, for lunch and got in a haircut. Oh, good thing no one listens. Yeah, <laughs> no one pays attention to what I'm doing, so it's all right. Well, people will pay attention to this episode specifically because we have a very special guest returning, our first ever guest balls. It's Dean Vickerman. Dean, how are you? I'm well. I'm glad you're happy to be back. Oh, it's been too long. 19 episodes. Yeah, you've been asking to come back. You want to be on 10, but we thought it was too soon. So we'll I on do 20. one, yeah. 20, 50, and 100. Oh, That's okay. 100. Schedule I can't wait me to 100. In for those yeah, yeah. Ones. We'll get balloons. We'll, we'll, we'll probably <laughs> yeah, be in a giant yeah. studio for Yeah, me. by then we'll, we'll be, be way time. out of here. Yeah. Oh, we'll be sitting by a beach or something like that. Yeah. We'll take it out of here. Yeah, on the road. Maybe like a. Well, I've done turn. one on the road. You, yeah, no, I mean to... like like a we just go around and interview different people, like our own van and everything. <laughs> like the. I know you want to. All Balls wants to do is turn this into Hamish and Andy. Yeah, so he wants to, he wants to turn it yeah. into the uh, Caravan of Courage or whatever that was. Yeah, exactly. That's, I was going to reference that, but I'll let you do it. <laughs> those were gold. I've still got some of those DVDs. <laughs> Dino, amazing to have you back on after such a so- strong start to the season. Um, I want to talk about, obviously, the round that's just been starting off in Tassie. You know, the, something that's always a danger game, Tassie in Tassie. Walk us through what it meant to go down there, put together a good performance and pick up another W. Yeah, I think going into the game, you know, we reflect on, you know, what happened in Melbourne and we didn't close out the game well. So we felt we just had to get one back. And um, I thought Ian Clark, he took it a little bit personally as well. And that showed in his performance. I thought he was just a monster defensively all night. And then there was a period in that third quarter um, where he just kind of took over the game offensively as well, and didn't close out the game. Took a little, took a little knock, and we 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 finished the game a little differently with um, Shafe out out as well. And so, but I guess we just we talk about the the depth of the group and how, how that continues to grow. And we haven't had our full squad on the floor yet, so mm. hopefully that's the that's to come very soon. Yeah, I want to talk about the start of that game. I was actually I was at a wedding on Friday, and so I turned all my notifications off. Once I got back from the wedding, switched it on, started watching it. And and I'll be honest, I was not feeling great when we were down 17-4 and then Joe checks in and it's a 17-4 run the other way to tie the game up at quarter time. Can you talk about his impact coming back in and just it, se- it seemed like he just got everything going? Yeah, we weren't great defensively at the start of the game, but I thought they were really on point. And, you know, we had th- probably three threes, I thought, in that first five minutes were pretty good shots that didn't go in so we couldn't we weren't hanging around but yeah once joe entered the game got to the foul line was a post presence changed a couple of things at the rim and um yeah to be tied up at quarter time after being down heavy like that uh, really set a tone my my confidence never wavered just so you know <laughs> not like ben over here uh, i was a fully confident the whole time uh but how much do you think I know you can't really answer the question, but like, so the first loss, the one loss we had was against Tasmania. It was one that probably slipped away from us. But how much do you think that helped in this game? Like, do you think, let's say we're undefeated going into that game. Do you think, I mean, as a coach, you never want to lose any, but do do you think it's helping helping now because we we got punched in the mouth early or it's it's a dumb question, is it? Would you rather be 7-0 and or what's our record? (laughs) Eight and zero. Eight and one. Eight and Would one. you rather be nine and zero or eight and one? I think but, we'd rather be nine be and zero. Playing, but being playing better right now. But I, do you think that played into the into the second game, the first loss? Yeah, I definitely think it was the extra moment. And we played well. You know, we won the last game we played down there your last year as mm-hmm. well. And um, we so we walked in there feeling good about how we've played down in Tassie and knowing that we could get a win and had a game plan to you know to attack some different people and I thought we did that well and at the end of the day it was my 300th day we just couldn't lose that one no, no that's absolutely why I, that's why I was not. confident the whole yeah. time I didn't even check the scores <laughs> I didn't need to all week you were downplaying it saying oh 300 doesn't matter but we, he had this one circle <laughs> 300 that's a big number 300 is a big number in anything you're doing does no, it it was it was kind of cool like the um you know the the team presented me with a game ball um at the end of the game and they'd all signed it and I thought I was walking in to get a, a shower of water or different things. I was like, I'm, I'm not coming in the locker room. Then. But they just wanted to give me a ball and, and stuff. So it was it was cool to 
um, you know, to get in a tough fight like it was against Scotty Roth and the and the Jack Jumpers to you know to re- to remember that three hundred. Yeah, and, and I guess it was sort of a full circle moment after that game coming back to John Kane Arena and they put it up on the big screen. You s- they celebrate with the crowd your three hundredth, but also you're there surrounded by guys, a lot of guys that you played with as. We were celebrating the 93 Tigers. You were a part of that 92 team. What was that like to come home and to to feel that love from the crowd, but also to to feel the love from some of your ex-teammates and, and people you're really close with? Yeah, just seeing some of those guys in the sitting in the box and while we're waiting for warm-ups to finish and just go over and shake their hand. And, and then, yeah, I, th- I thought... I talked about in the press conference, but the, <laughs> Robert Sibley and Stephen Whitehead were, <laughs> were really good mates on that team. And yeah, a minute and a half before the game, they were coming up, giving me a big hug, and I was I was kind of ready to call security, like who's coming <laughs> at me. But uh, those those it was a really talented team. You know, I, I enjoyed being with them the year before, and um, you know, for them to break through and get that first championship for the Tigers was was a huge huge effort. And how how important do you think it is for United as a club to obviously remember those Tigers teams, remember those. That, that's an iconic team. We obviously had El Westover last week and, and talked about that team, but how important is it for us to celebrate the history and, and celebrate those guys 30 years on? Oh, it's hugely important. You know, when you, you hang those banners up there, you know, every week and you've got the retired jerseys and, um, you know, we're still trying to create that connection, you know, back to the, the Tigers and, and and I get it, you know, if I'm well Westover or Lindsay or something, there's a club that you created and then it just disappears. And so, you know, I understand there was a bitterness from some people and some fans for a while and you kind of history is kind of lost. So I think it's, we're doing our part right now to make sure that we keep that history alive from, from a, such a foundation club. Mm, and then after that, they had a nice presentation at halftime. Obviously, you didn't get to see any of it live, but it seemed like after that presentation, after halftime, United really kicked into gear. The Hawks gave it a good fight, but obviously able to uh, United obviously able to sort of push over the top and, and pick up you know a sixth win in sixteen days. Yeah, I was. You know, Any time you go into a game, you, you, Delhi's not playing and Ian Clark's not playing and it's like, oh, this this team, you know, really challenged us last time we played them. And so to have those two pieces missing and, um, you know, be on the back end of, you know, the, the sixth game in 16 days, it's like, oh, we could easily just roll over here and, and take a loss. But the, you know, the pride the boys showed in the in the second half just to say, no, we're not, we're not losing this one. And, um, you know, I thought Shea just found another level in that second half. And, you know, CG was obviously amazing. I thought Ariel ah, played with crazy energy like he, he hadn't even played these other five games. He just come out and was just a, a menace and a monster and, yeah, there was a lot of other people. Tanner Krebs' best game. Flynn Cameron's probably his best game for the club as well. So those other guys stepping up to get the win in, in the absence of some key guys was huge. Do you, uh, before the game, did you write on the board, Chris, hit seven threes in this game? <laughs> How much of, is, that, is that coaching or, you know, like what a luxury that is to have a guy that can that can do that. Um, watching from the sides, I mean, you take some of those threes. I don't know. I guess it's with a shooter like that. I mean, he can shoot from anywhere, right? I mean, that that's I mean, that's what he's earned and that's it's it's incredible to see some of those shots just watching it before we came in here and just his shot making ability at all times is 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 amazing. And defensively, they they're they're, ta- they're talking about that too. Like before the game there's like do not leave this guy open. I don't care where he is. He's going to shoot from anywhere and he still finds ways to get the ball up. And um yeah, so it, you didn't write you didn't that wasn't <laughs> one of your uh things on the board before the game. No, we we did we talked about people stepping up and you know in my um, career with him any time we've had people down or especially the respect that he has for Delhi and Ian Clark to say all right I, I've got to do a little bit more mm-hmm. those guys were you know Ian got us that win in in Tassie and and they took me out of the game tonight I've just got to you know find a way to go ahead and hunt you know, more threes and we kind of continue to talk about that. It's about him hunting 10 great threes a game. And I, oh, think, yeah. he, I think he shot 13 or something yeah. the other yeah, night. Yeah, seven and 13. So, yeah, we have, we've had a pretty good record when, when he gets uh, <laughs> yeah. that amount up. So, um, yeah, same with some other guys. We want Tanner Krebs to hunt four great threes. And, and uh, if we can get that, you know, 12, 13 mate threes, we'll be pretty good. So you do have a number, like you do at least have some type of number that you want, like hunting threes you talk about, yeah. I've never heard of talk. Yeah, never heard that. Oh, we didn't do that. 
back in the day. We I don't think so. I never, no one said Bulls had his own numbers. numbers. Hunt, you get 10 up? Hunt a certain amount of threes. No, <laughs> I don't think I ever got 10 threes up. <laughs> Bulls, a couple had, times maybe. Bulls had, I want, 20 mid-post Yeah, matches. mid-range. There's a lot of mid-range. Hunt, hunt 15 mid-range shots in this game. <laughs> but you talk about guys stepping up. It's something that we talked about even before the show. I think we got six guys averaging double figures and Shea's averaging 9.7 a game. Just talk about the depth of this team. It's obviously something that we touched on in the preseason in the recruiting process, just getting that depth there to be able to step up whenever there's an injury or whenever there's two injuries, something like that. Can you talk about what it's like as a coach to have that depth there and to have such reliable scoring from so many guys? Yeah, it's it's kind of, you know, when we built the team to say depth was massive to say if we had injuries at point guard that we weren't good enough last year to cover, if we had injuries at centre and obviously the luxury of having Rob Lowe come in for a period of time. But, yeah, I'm not sure if we have seven guys average double figures on the year. You know, that'll probably take a fair few injuries for for everybody to have those kind of numbers because Ian's missed three games, Delhi's missed four games, Joe's missed – whatever, four or five games mm. as well. So um, everybody healthy, yeah, maybe we still do have the five or six guys averaging double figures. But, yeah, to be able to – everyone in this league is going to have injuries throughout the year and everyone's going to have a tough schedule part. And so um, when you have kind of injuries and tough schedule combined and to you know to come through at 6-0, and oh, it's, a, it's an impressive feat. And I guess you see that – with that depth, guys like Flynn Cameron stepped up in the Illawarra game and it was Kyle Bowen the game before, 17 off the bench, 17 in 13 minutes. You know, having those guys who can just step up when when their number is called but also when it's not their time, they're just the ultimate team guys, especially for young guys. How important is that? Yeah, I think when you base your play on how well you play defensively, um, then, you know, that's that's the standard and you're going to get minutes from that. And then, you know, if it, whatever comes at the offensive end, if it's your night, well, you get to play a little bit more and, and things as well. But um, we know different people are going to have different shooting nights. But to say we haven't shot the ball well as a, as a team, you know, under 35% from the three, we think we can be, you know, in the next three quarters that we can, you know, can really extend that up to the closer to the 38 if we if we get hot a little bit more, but yeah, we won games on the defense. But yeah, our offensive ratings just got better and better mm. as this team learns how to grow together. Mm. And we talked about CG earlier; it just popped into my head. I had to circle back because something that we didn't realize on game day that was the most points he's ever scored for United thirty three. He'd never had more than thirty three. It was the most he scored in nine years or something. What's it like to have a guy that just it, he just seems to get better? It's not the 50, though, is it? Well, no, no it's, it's not, not the 50. It's not the 50. <laughs> I, know. I wasn't on this, this team. I wasn't playing, so he didn't get 50 because I was playing in that game. We talked about that last time. That was 25 of those points were mine. <laughs> <laughs> no, the 30, you know, it was, it was, it was great. And, then, you know, that's who he is. It's when needed and big moments, he's always going to he's always gonna step up. And, um, you know, really the truth of it, over the course of my time here, we always talked about like at some point CG's like moved to the six man role and, and it's just not happening. He just, <laughs> he's just staying as Hold a starter on. and staying as one of the, you know, top 10 players in the league. And it, it just at some point, I'm sure it may drop off a little bit, but right now let's, let's, let's ride this thing as long as we can and keep him as high on the, on the, on the three point shooting as possible. Well, don't let him hear that. He'll, Oh, maybe no, it just motivate been, him. Yeah, no. Shooting is such such a premium skill. I mean, if you can shoot and, you know, he can get up and down the court, he's still in great shape. I and mean, if you got a shooter like that, you, know, you always want that on the floor. Oh, for sure. But and it's not like we're hiding him defensively. Like, oh, yeah, we're yeah. giving him, you know, really solid jobs. And I think he's he's been outstanding the last few years defensively as well. And, um, yeah, he was cooked the other night. The minutes that he played in both games was a lot. And um, so, you know, but he didn't sit down for long. He recovered pretty quickly and we got him back out there. Absolutely. Well, I want to get to a few fan questions after the break. So we'll come back with Dean Vickerman and a bit of a mailbag after this. I want to stay up to date with everything happening at Melbourne United. Download the Melbourne United app today. Filled with videos, audio and articles about your favourite team. It's the one-stop shop for everything Melbourne United. Download the Melbourne United app via the App Store on iOS or the Google Play Store on Android. And we're back on the Extra Pass podcast and we're going to get to a mailbag segment. We reached out to the fans, wanted to hear from them and what questions they had for you, Dino. So number one, 
I've got one here from John. This is a hard hitting one. It's my dad, John. I don't believe so. <laughs> but uh, do you ever get a sore knee from kneeling on the sidelines? <laughs> it was it was it was kind of born from I think being around Brett Brown and uh, you know he'd always he'd always kind of kneel a little bit and and it was in respect to your your players and your coaches. Like if I stand out there, I, they can't see what's going on, and <laughs> I, w- I want them to be able to see the game. And so to me, yeah, I just start there and let everybody see what's going on in the game, and then you know work the sidelines afterwards. But yeah, I do look at my pants after the season. I was like, damn, this knee. Is that, this, so it's <laughs> always a right knee down. Yeah, it's, right always, knee down. Yeah. <laughs> it's kind of yeah. it's wearing out. I've got to get new pants. So, <laughs> <laughs> but, nah, you know, getting up gets a little harder as you get older. But different <laughs> things. But no, it's, back to backs are tough. <laughs> oh, yeah. yeah. <laughs> are, there, are there any particular sidelines that are harder on the knee, like bad floors or? No, it's more about the the, the height of the signage right now, whether I can uh, lean on it with the arm a uh, little bit yeah, or yeah. Yeah, if I've got to push down. You know, yeah. There's a lot going into it. It's I could kneel anywhere. <laughs> <laughs> Versatile. <laughs> well, we'll get to a, a more basketball question than that. From Ryan, can you walk us through what, fans can potentially see from a Joe Ariel combination on the court together. Yeah. First day of, you know, had them, them practice together today and, and, um, you know, it looked good. It's so you just got to change your normal system and make some tweaks to take advantage of, of both of them. And, um, you know, we saw Joe playing more as a four man today and let Ariel screen and let Joe make pass decisions and make off the dribble decisions and, um, you know, conversely, you know, we, we saw Ariel do that at times as well and him him making passes to Joe. So, yeah, it's just about getting our spacing right. Um, you know, I think defensively, obviously, they're two of the best centers in the league defensively. So to have that kind of rim protection um, and then just look at our, our coverages with the guards with both those guys on the floor. But, yeah, pretty, pretty exciting practice, you know, first time seeing them, you know, play together um, today and – yeah, we look forward to what we can put that on the floor. Yeah, I went down for a little bit and, and watched it. It looks overwhelming. It just there's just there's a lot of length everywhere, and then to put shooters around them because it's hard not to you know if one of them gets a deep seal, it's hard not to bring a double. Yeah, that's what we kind of saw today that you you know they needed to double the post because there was always a, a mismatch and that really did open things up for shooters, but also out of the on ball that they continually had to try and tag to, to stop the roll to the rim and, and that opened up shooting as well. So, yeah, I think the benefits are, um, you know, both for the guards and, and for the bigs as well. We, we, we saw some good high-low dunks and, <laughs> and we saw some, some three balls as well. So, um, yeah, we look forward to, to seeing it on the floor. And especially it's something you touched on, his ability to pass out of the post. I thought he had a couple of great passes um, for easy buckets on the weekend. Yeah, I, th- I thought both of those guys, the evolution of their game is to is to face up and, and see where the double's coming from and, and be able to pass out of it. Joe's, you know, only playing 20 minutes a game, but he's on a career high of two assists a game at the moment. And so, yeah, and Ari was just making some real solid decisions out of, out of the post as well when doubles are coming. So, yeah, great growth. Yeah, well, we've talked about the bigs. Let's talk about a very important guard, Shay Ely, from Bucky. Have you or the club ever considered trying to clone Shay Ely? <laughs> clone him? I th- yeah, I don't know. Two Shay Ely's would be... Two, yeah, mm. Why not two? Get more than that. <laughs> Get four or five of them. <laughs> I mean, yeah, that's a weird. That's a weird. Is that the clone sheep? Is that like a New Zealand joke? You know, because the first clone was a sheep, was a sheep, right? It's a nice connection you're making, but yeah. I don't think there was that much thought into it. Well, I don't know. I mean, maybe that's a deep, like, maybe I only, I only get that because my, you know, my comedy so, runs so deep. Yeah, no, so knowledgeable. A, yeah, I'm just so. We, t- always, we always mess so around in road trips and it's like, imagine if Ariel married this <laughs> tennis player or Serena Williams. It was like what, a Yao, what, what, that's you know? how Yao Ming yeah. came about. The, the government put the two tallest people in China together and encouraged them to get married. And Is that true? Yao Ming, yeah, that's true. I did not know that's that. That's true. Well, we'll get we'll get to the next mailbag question, the last one. This one's from Ellie, and it's something we talked yep, talked a bit about earlier. Three hundred games into your career as a head coach, what's been the most rewarding moment of your coaching career? Well, rewarding it might be something from Mornington when you were running <laughs> Mornington back when you just started. <laughs> the Pran Pistons back in the <laughs> um, no rewarding. I think you know when you look at rewards as a coach, you um, you like to see players progress. 
yeah, you know, championships are always you know reward for for the hard work. You'd like to see coaches you know progress in their career, and so I think they're the the great rewards to seeing you know people advance. You know, I always talk about the the Akene Beck way shot that he makes at you know the end of. Um, the game in New Zealand to win the championship against Cairns and um, I guess that's a rewarding moment to say one of my assistant coaches came up with a play when we opened the floor up to coaches to experiment and, and Judd Flavel picked a play and then in a key moment we said he said how about how about this play and we run it and we score and so I felt it was rewarding for for me to give him the responsibility to um you know, to experiment and for us to trust him and then go through with it and, and run a play and execute it perfectly and win a championship. So that's a pretty rewarding moment in a lot of different ways in your career. And I guess as you look forward, you know, we just hope there's 300 more games of full of rewarding moments. Um, you know, you're, you're making your way up there in the all-time wins as well. Um, I guess as you look back on your career and you look back at the success you've had, are there any points where you sort of, well, I guess how – how much do you reflect on the on the career that you've had, I guess, while you're in it? I know it's sort of a weird question. Yeah, I think it's a moment too. That's I think what the milestones come up and you you know, what do you do with that milestone? It's it's probably good to just reflect a little bit for a moment about, you know, how you got there and and where you've been and for me to, you know, to be in New Zealand, to be in Singapore, to be in Australia, to, you know, have all kinds of different experiences in this league is, has been, you know, hugely rewarding and and hopefully um, has rounded me a little bit as a person. But um, to get back to where, you know, it all started for me and, and come back to Melbourne United and just see the, the growth of this club and how we're celebrating so many good causes and um, you know, feature games right now with the Indigenous game, you know, coming up this week as well. And, um, yeah, they just – I love the, how our crowd and the community is really celebrating, you know, how we're going about presenting basketball. Well, you mentioned the Indigenous game coming up. We're going to preview that game and sort of the rest of the season to come after this break. Melbourne United memberships are on sale now. Lock in your seat for the most exciting show in Australian sport – and guarantee you're there for every highlight across next season. To find out more, go to membership.melbourneutd.com.au. And we're back on the Extra Pass podcast with our very special guest, Dean Vickerman. Dean, we got a game coming up, like you said, the Indigenous round on Cup Day Eve against the Perth Wildcats. Seven days off, something you haven't and you haven't and the team hasn't gotten to enjoy for quite a while can you talk about sort of the run into this game and, and how important it is to keep this streak going yeah we had um a blackout day on monday where players weren't allowed to call coaches to to get a workout <laughs> yeah. we, we we needed everybody to to take a little break and um so everyone in, hopefully enjoyed that day off yesterday and um, we got back to to work today and there's some guys that you know needed their bodies to recover so three or four guys um kind of sat out of practice today but we still had a really competitive practice and yeah, you know, we'll work those guys back in and great to see delhi back on the floor uh, working and looking good and um, ian clark not too far away and so um potentially have the, the full roster for the first time on <laughs> on monday but it's not guaranteed yet and and, and you know this kind of last little period where we play play three you know, really good offensive teams. You know, Perth are a, a great offensive team when they're up and running. Um, you know, then we've got South East who are really, you know, putting points on the board and I think we close that out with Sydney as well. So, you know, our defence is going to be – have to be on point until we get to this FIBA window and, um, yeah, see what we get done in these three games. Yeah, how important is this stretch? I think it's 50-odd days where we don't leave Melbourne when we're here at John Kane Arena before the long road trip in the new year. How important is this stretch to just bank as many home wins as possible? Like Ball said, you never go into games thinking, oh, you know, this is one we can lose. But how important is it just to, to bank as many wins as possible here? Yeah, you know, the, the, the away games are, I think, two southeast games as mm. well through this period. <laughs> so we, we, we just don't leave Melbourne. We're just playing at John Kane. And, um, but I like that there's little breakups. I like that we've got these three games and then the FIBA window and we get to, you know, do something a little bit different. It's not like we're just every week we've got the same program. We've got nice little intervals in it and we've got our 
annual cricket game in there somewhere and always good to see our players try and play cricket. <laughs> and, um, yeah, we've got some other fun things going on as well. So, um, But banking games, you know, it's, I don't know. I, we just break the season up into quarters and – Right now we're we're two and zero oh in this quarter, and and any time you get five wins in a in a quarter, you're in a really good place, and 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 that's the goal again. Who's putting out heat on the cricket pitch? Um, who we got this year? Do we have we, any spinners? We, and pe- surely just to try and throw a bit of spin down there, but he's gone. Um, D Mac was a nice baseball kind of cross bat <laughs> kind of batsman. Um, I think TK. I think TK's got a little bit of cricket in him. I think he he might come down with a little bit of pace and shake some people up. So <laughs> um, yeah, we'll see. It'd be interesting. I'm not sure. I can't, I can't remember Joe and Ariel if they've they, yeah they think they played some cricket. But Ariel played. They hockey. should be able to bowl some bounces. He played hockey. Yeah, well, he should be decent with the bat if he was, if he played hockey growing up, right? He, d- he does love playing hockey. Yeah, ice hockey. Um, and then. As we look into this Indigenous round game and you, you talk about Perth as a dangerous offensive team, they're also a desperate team right now. They're not where they want to be on the on the table. What are you expecting um, as they come in on Monday? Yeah, we, we get to see them. They've got a home game against Adelaide on the Saturday and Adelaide are playing really good basketball at the moment as well. So that was a good contest last time Adelaide went over there. But yeah, now you add DJ to that mix as well and – a um, little bit more chemistry with that Adelaide team and they're a big win in New Zealand for them and, and they'll go in there feeling pretty confident. So, yeah, I think there's a – Bryce, you can't keep him down for this no. long. And, <laughs> and so at some point he's going he's gonna to get cooking and, and, and hopefully it's uh, not against us. But I think we've – you know, we've got some – quality defenders that make his job really hard and we know he may still shoot 20 shots against us but we're, our job is to try and keep that as a, the lowest percentage possible and um, you know we've had a few games where we've done that really well and we've had some few games where he's got the better of us but um, yeah looking looking forward to it. Yeah fingers crossed we can lock him up again. That's, that's about all I had for you Dean. Do you have any Mornington Breakers questions? You always try to throw it in there. <laughs> we could do another sec- take a break and do another, <laughs> another segment. Of this. Dean's got to get going but thanks for coming on. That's number 20 so hopefully around 40 or 50 we'll get back on again. Yeah he uh, said 50 and then 100. Yeah okay. Alright 50 and 100. Alright write <laughs> that in. in. Thanks a lot Dean. Appreciate it.